So why am I driving a midnight purple 3 R34 Skyline GTR V-Spec through the streets of Sydney after midnight? A long-time friend from WA asked me to inspect this car for him to buy. Not something I normally do, but Nathan was the first person to ever let me drive a GTR back in 2002. An R32 GTR with R34 wheels and a Garrett single turbo making over 400 wheel horsepower. Huge for back then. So Nathan is part of the reason behind my GTR obsession. Also, he was buying the car off another friend of ours, Romanos, who is well known for his mental R34 GTR RHM. Nathan has had a lot of GTRs since that R32, including a Nismo equipped Midnight Purple R34 that was recently sold to Canada for over $800,000. All of this, combined with being 20 years since I first drove a GTR, got me thinking about what has happened in the GTR scene in the last two decades. The GTR's legacy, its cult following, and its value. You no doubt have heard about the massive price rises of Skyline GTRs in recent years. This Midnight Purple 3 V-Spec R34 is approaching half a million Australian dollars. For me, it's hard to fathom that I'm currently driving a car that's probably worth more than a Lamborghini Huracan. In many ways, it's still just a Skyline to me because I've been around them for so long. But really, it's just supply versus demand, and the popularity has increased massively. A lot of people want them, and there isn't much supply. And it's not just Americans who want them. Australia, New Zealand, and the UK have been buying them since they were released. Everyone wants them. So don't blame the Americans for the price. It's simply supply and demand. Once R34s become legal in the US from 2024, they could just keep climbing even further, and they'll bring the price of R32s and R33s with them. The price rise has meant that more people are talking about keeping them stock and storing them away. But here's the thing, have you ever driven a stock GTR? They're laggy, they understeer, and often the suspension and steering is worn out. Factory performance was impressive when they were released, but the appeal of the GTR has always been what it can do when modified. So don't collect them and ruin the scene. Modify them, race them, enjoy them for what made them what they are. The cult of GTR was built off the back of Group A racing, then Gran Turismo, Fast and Furious, and the highly modified GTRs of the late 90s and early 2000s, and now it's the YouTube and influencer generation modifying their GTRs. The price rise though, has also made repairs and insurance more expensive. However, the value means more and more companies are starting to make more and more aftermarket parts that OEM simply doesn't. Performance parts companies are still developing new and better parts for the RB26 and the GTR platform. The price rise also means that GTRs are being modified to a higher standard with higher quality parts. They're no longer 20 grand slappers with cheap parts anymore. They're worth good money, so they're worth spending good money on. So do it. Refurbish it, restore it, modify it, make it faster, drive it, enjoy it. Use your GTR for the reason that it became popular. Don't be scared of its value. Don't be scared of putting a scratch on it. 800 horsepower can be responsive and reliable these days, and the chassis can handle well over 1,000 horsepower, no problem. So don't give up on the GTR dream. So what's going to happen to this GTR? Knowing Nathan, probably a built motor, stroker kit, sequential transmission and twin high mount turbos and a thousand horsepower. Just the usual GTR dream.